Can you start and grow a civil engineering company without any business education or an MBA? Well, of course the answer is yes, because this week we have with us Blake Calvert, and Blake is the president and CEO of Core Consultants, and he's done just that. And he's gonna share some of the strategies that he's used to start his business during a recession and grow it to a very strong civil engineering firm. First, before we hear from Blake, a word from our sponsor for this episode, Pannoni. Since Pannoni's founding more than five decades ago, their clients trust Pannoni's commitment to elevating the impact of projects in the communities they serve. By partnering with their clients, they establish relationships that create trust and longevity. Pannoni approaches the start of every project as the beginning of a collaboration. With the rapid change in technology, Pannoni's clients know they are getting innovative methods in delivering quality services for smart, sustainable, and resilient solutions. Pannoni is relentless in their aim to bring fresh perspective and new technologies. Pannoni measures achievement in innovation, efficiency, and excellence. Its milestones are bigger than any one project, and every project affects the community, no matter how large or small. For more information, visit Pannoni.com. That's P-E-N-N-O-N-I dot com. Right now, I'd like to welcome our guest onto the show for today. Blake Calvert is the president and CEO at Core Consultants. Blake, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Great to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, of course. Um, uh, love being able to talk to you and learn about more what uh, you're doing, Anthony, but then also uh, being able to talk about Core. Yeah, for sure. So to kind of jump in here, Blake, tell us a little bit about Core, where you're located, the services you offer, how many people you have about uh, Core is based uh, in the Denver, Colorado metropolitan area. Uh, our main office is a little bit south of downtown uh, in, a, in an older suburb, Inglewood, Colorado, but pretty, still pretty central. Uh, that's our main base where the majority of our employees are. Uh, we do have a, a small office up in the mountains of Colorado. I mean, we're in Colorado. We got to have a presence up in the mountains and it's up in Winter Park. Uh, we're near the ski area that's up there, but uh, basically serving mountain communities in Grand County. Um, as far as employees, uh, right now we're hovering. Uh, we'd love to have a few more employees like many firms. Uh, we definitely have demand in our Colorado market, but uh, we're hovering around plus or minus 70 people right now. And um, CORE focuses on uh, three primary market sectors of land development, uh, energy, and um, uh, public uh, infrastructure and uh, the energy component that we do is a big part of our diversification and it primarily focuses on renewables. So it's certainly does sometimes stretch into traditional energy, but primarily we're working with uh, solar and wind and, and diversification of the grid. And so uh, beyond those market sectors, it's, uh, you know, gets, gets us to the engineering part. Uh, we, the, the big, Part of our technical skill set is civil engineering and um, kind of the traditional areas of that. And uh, we have a land surveying group uh, within CORE. And then also we have uh, uh, natural resources scientists uh, that deal with a lot of our energy environmental permitting and everything. And so that's kind of the main, I guess, technical expertise we have within the firm. That's great. And about how many people are you? About plus or minus 70. Um, we've... Uh, We've grown from seven to 70 in about uh, nine years. Wow. So, so let's go there for a minute. Tell us a little bit about kind of your career journey and then like the origin of CORE. Uh, certainly. Uh, I'll give you a short version. Um, CORE, CORE started in 2014. Uh, so again, this is wrapping up our ninth year. Next year will be number 10. Uh, it's been it's been a really long journey. I mean, I'd say a lot of the origin of of what core was to become and and kind of really brainstorming kind of the vision and the potential we could be really started to take place about companies that a lot of us as founders of where we've worked from, obviously, you know, experiences we've had. I've I've had really good experiences early in my career with small businesses. Um, that really gave people a lot of autonomy and being able to be involved, not only learning 
the civil engineering profession, but then also getting involved with the business that I never expected out of school. And then uh, moved on to some other opportunities where um, uh, working with larger companies that gave me a little bit more, you know, fully functioning corporate type entities that were, you know, longer established and, and certainly um, expanding businesses and setting up offices that gave me that experience. But the real kind of critical point was really the Great Recession. Uh, I did not need, like many firms being started, I did not need to start core during that time. I had uh, employers there, but I, I guess what I really learned when 2008, 2009 hit is I needed to maybe take a little bit more control of my career and those that surround me th that are part of this team that we've created over many years and not just be fully dependent on another company that things will always be good and kind of that free spirit approach. And so really the the vision and idea of CORE really started during the Great Recession of really wanting to kind of take more control of our own destiny and then when is the right time. And so 2014, uh, we kind of hunkered down as the economy was recovering out of the Great Recession. And then um, 2014 became the, the kind of the pivotal time of when we thought there, there was enough stability in the economy in our Denver market here. So going back a little bit in your career, did you always know that you wanted to start your own company as an engineer or did you, were you just getting into your career growing and at some point it kind of hit you? Well, what did that look like for you in terms of goals? That's a great question. I mean, I, I can tell you, I never aspired to do what I'm doing today, which is kind <laughs> of the irony. Uh, I knew people, um, CORE was started, let's see, when I was 44 years old probably 10 years prior to that, I did in the, in the early 2000s, there were many for, uh, firms being established at that time. Again, a strong point in our economy, um, some consolidation in our industry, which was kind of being the spark for a few people to break out on their own. And uh, there was a lot of firms I saw formed that I had relationships with that they, they struggled significantly when um, through the various stressors in the economy, whether it was kind of the 9-11 uh, or the, the dot-com bust and stuff that started to affect certain components of our overall economy and everything. And the, I saw those companies struggle. So I'm like, man, I don't think I ever want to do that ever. However, again, as you said, you know, when you're maturing through your career and learning about, I've always been fascinated about the business side of consulting and learning more and more and getting more confident. And so I think I just matured at a level in my career where I'm like, I think I can do this and I think I can do it better than other firms I see and I aspire to do it better. And so I think I'm willing to take that risk, but um, hmm. no, out of school, um, thinking about the business components, I, again, I, I have not gone to business school. I do not have an MBA. Um, but I'm definitely a student of our industry and try to absorb and learn and study uh, and network to, to know what other firms do and what's working for them and what's not working so that I can hopefully absorb all that and, and be a better leader for CORE. No, that's great. And, I, you know, I'm really happy to hear you say that last part about, you know, not having an MBA, not going to business school, just because I feel like there's a lot of engineers out there that maybe feel like they would want to have their own business, but don't feel like they have the business background to do it or the goal to do it. And in your case, it sounds like really what it was, was your goal was more, I want to take control of my career. And you saw owning a business as a potential vehicle to do that. And you and thought you could figure it out. You know, you could, you could talk to the right people and learn what you needed to learn which I think is a good message for viewers because I don't think you should be limited in your career. Like for example, if I don't have an MBA, I can't start my own engineering business, right? Or if it wasn't a goal of mine, then I just can't do it. And I, so I think that, you know, hearing that from you is a, is a positive because it shows people that, you know, your career kind of unfolds as it goes. It doesn't necessarily have to follow a path that you set out from college because at the end of the day, everything's changed. Ch things change all the time. We know that from engineering projects. We know that from what's happened with the world in the last few years with COVID and everything else. Um, and it can certainly happen in, in one's career. So Blake, if I were to ask your staff, 
to describe your management style, how do you think they would describe it? Uh, that's a tough one, I guess. When, when you're in a position to be um, a leader of a firm, certainly you, you want to be viewed a certain way. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I love empowering people. I love, uh, and I'm probably to some fault, I love giving people lots of a long runway, lots of autonomy. Um, uh, empowered to be creative and to kind of identify things they, that need to be done and then having, you know, feeling empowered that they feel like that they can affect change. Uh, I am not a um, micromanager or anything. I, I love um, to kind of create that vision. And this is where I've kind of discovered of why I like the business side is like, I love the strategy and the visioning of things and then putting a team around me that can even challenge me um, to say, what do we want to do and how do we want to solve this business issue? Or it's really no different. It's kind of translating what we're taught uh, through engineering school to be better problem solvers. Obviously we're, we already kind of maybe have those qualities within our personality already, but you know, going to school or the learning process and evolving as a person uh, we get better and learn how to adapt what we've learned at each step. And so um, to me, in designing a firm, I really wanted to make it about collaboration. I did not want it to be you know, a sole proprietor. I thought there's strength in numbers in building a, lar a larger, broader team to bring in all the ideas and talents around you, including uh, shareholders that you know, all bring a certain component to the business um, that uh, um, we diversify each other. And so um, I guess that's where I do think maybe at a fault, I'm a little bit too hands off. But then again, I think sometimes people appreciate, you know, that they've, they've got the ability to kind of take the opportunity and run with it too. That's great. And I really like the idea of a collaborative approach, especially in the world of civil engineering, where essentially everything we do is on teams, and we're constantly collaborating with people. So I find that sometimes as a leader, you know, we feel like we have to do everything, you know, just because we feel like that's like what a leader does, like stereotypical, but it's not the case, right? There's servant leadership, there's a lot of collaboration that can happen. And that can really be kind of an impetus for growing a much more powerful, you know, overall experience for everyone involved, because they feel like, hey, my leader's going to let me input here, you know, just because this person might be my supervisor doesn't mean that they think that they know it all and they're telling me how to do everything. I have a little bit of a leash to make some decisions on my own. And quite frankly, I think that's how people grow, right? I mean, if, they're, if their leader doesn't give them an opportunity to take some chances and take on some responsibility, then how can they ever like grow on their own? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I, I do think I've incorporated uh, uh, servant leadership approach. I really love the, the teaching aspects of, of, of the informal mentoring of just being there to help, you know, um, coach someone to get to this step and, and helping them um, have the, the, the opportunity to explore. They, they're they're going to learn it the best when they have the opportunity to fully uh, experience it, whether it's a success or a shortcoming. The, some of the best learning opportunities are when people are allowed just to have that autonomy and they may fail, but I know some of my best growing uh, opportunities as an individual and as a professional have been when I failed miserably. And by the way, that happens for all of us a lot, especially even when you're, you know, trying to be a successful firm and everything. There's a lot of things that you just have to admit failure and just say, how are we going to get better and learn from it and then try to create that kind of learning mentality uh, within the culture of your firm. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that that's such an important philosophy of like allowing people to learn and try some things on their own. I mean, I know at EMI, we do a lot of corporate training and we're always saying, okay, here's one topic for today, go practice it with a client and then come back next week and let's talk about it. Because at the end of the day, like if you're constantly telling people, here's what you can do, here's how to do it, but you never let them actually give it a shot, like on the job, it's really difficult for them, for, for a lot of people to be able to learn something unless they're actually using it in, in kind of like experiential learning. So I think that that's a great practice when it comes to leadership. And this question I really like to ask leaders, especially based on everything we've gone over, gone through the last few years is, 
as a leader, whether it's 10 people, 70 people, a thousand people that you're leading, you're going to go through these situations that are very up and down, kind of these roller coaster rides, if you will, when you're growing a business or when you're CEO of a company, wherever the case may be. And you're, everyone in your company is kind of looking at you in terms of your reaction to these things to kind of think about, you know, if whether they should stay calm or whether they should get panicked. And so how do you as a leader try not to like overreact or underreact to specific situations, knowing that kind of, you know, you're kind of, everyone's kind of looking to you for that guidance. Yeah, that's something that kind of evolves along the way. Um, and, and sometimes you struggle with it. Um, I would say starting a company in 2014, um, when, when it's a good economy and things are going well and the work is coming in and you're able to recruit and get more people to kind of get things going, certainly as you're scaling it, there's stress and can be some growing pains there. But again, when the economy is good, but I, I learned a lot as a leader and what I need to do better, obviously the way the last few years have been is I knew from studying previous major stressors on the economy and just not just our local economy, but the global world that, you know, when a pandemic hits, what do you do? Mm-hmm. No one's ever taught me what to do. And so I do see that um, when the pandemic hit and COVID and trying to decipher what to do, I mean, I think I'm an engineer. I definitely, uh, I think I, as a leader, I try to come in and not be overly emotional. Um, what people need out of a leader is certainly to have empathy and understanding of, because we're dealing with people, but at the same time, sometimes if you're in a panic, you're not helping yourself or your team, they need a steady leader just to come in and logically kind of go through steps, but that's always kind of a battle. And with the pandemic and then some personal setbacks over the last couple of years, uh, I don't think I dealt with stress as good as I, I could have done and maybe uh, did start to expose myself that, um, uh, but I, I am a human being. And so sometimes mm-hmm. we personally go through struggles and then that does get revealed through our people and everything. But I think we just have to take all that in stride, but uh, people do have a certain expectation and confidence in you. So you kind of have to be, you want to be vulnerable, but at the same time, they expect you to be the steady the steady eddy too. And Mm -hmm. so you kind of have to have your, your personal um, self there, but then also integrate, you know, what does the company expect of me every day? Because they're always kind of looking at you to say, what do we do next? And that's kind of where I've had to learn and evolve as a leader through various stages Uh, And again, like I said, I kind of came in as the reluctant entrepreneur and kind of the reluctant leader. Mm. Uh, I don't really desire to be the figurehead every day and having to be in the spotlight, but um, it's something you just gain more confidence. And again, when you've got good people around you, it it helps and helps you do your job better and it makes it a lot more fun, you know, um, uh, when you start developing that structure. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. I don't think there's an equation or a playbook you know, for this type of thing, it's kind of like one of these things that you're continuing to learn and evolve on. I mean, I think like emotional awareness and intelligence is a big part of this. And it's not something that anyone, forget about engineers, but I think anyone is comfortable with or anyone really learns except being exposed to these kinds of situations. And I do think owning a company is one way that you can kind of get a crash course on it and get exposed to it and kind of have to deal with it. And I think for me personally, At EMI, what I try to remind myself is that, you know, everyone that works here, you know, they're counting on EMI for their, you know, livelihood, right? In terms of like their stability, their family. And so I try to keep that in mind. And I try to say, you know, I want to stay calm. I want to make sure everyone here is calm because at the end of the day, I want them to be able to go home to their families and say, hey, I've got a good job. Everything is okay. And to, for me, that sometimes that's helpful in dealing with these situations because if I'm a little nervous, I can try to get rid of those nerves by saying, "Listen, these people and plus their families." So, like, multiply our number of employees by three, four, five people. That's like who I have to kind of think about, you know. That that's exactly my philosophy. I, I had it under the hood before we we started core and as it was getting started, but that's what 
in, in these stressful moments, uh, what fills my bucket is I've, I've always thought we needed to be a purpose-led organization, but for me as an individual and as a leader, you see what impact you can have on people's personal lives. And that's mm -hmm. what is something I, I actually, I can't even say that I underappreciated it in starting it. Um, that is something I've kind of grown into of fully recognizing the impact that um, as people join core and that I can help them in their career, I can teach them to be how to do this. Uh, we're not, there's no secrets of how to run a consulting company, but I want to teach people to be an entrepreneur. And, and if they love working at core, uh, I'll embrace that. But if they want to go and take another step to start their own business and to try something else, I'll embrace that and, and be very satisfied that I at least help them get to that next step in their career and help their family and all the things that a company can provide and impact you know, not just the individual, but the family as a whole. I, I take that kind of, you know, purpose and meaning to my role uh, very seriously. No, that's great. And I share the same philosophy. I'm always, I'm always saying that like the company needs to help individuals who work here succeed at work and at home, right? Because if you're doing that, I think everyone wins. And I think as companies, we can't just think about, okay, everyone who works here is here to help the company grow. It's also like on the flip side, the company can help them grow like in their careers and in their lives. And so I like having those conversations with everyone here as well. Um, and I think it's a, and I think this goes beyond being a CEO. I mean, I think if you're a manager or leader, I think anyone that you lead, like you have an impact on them when they go home. And like, we need to keep that in mind that every conversation you have, you know, a piece of advice that you give them around something, they may go home and teach their kids something based on that. So I think like as a leader, just that kind of that influence is something that I think if we keep that in mind, it can be very beneficial when it comes to how we react to things. And so I think that that's, there's a lot to think about, but all right. So let's switch gears a little bit, talking about technology. Technology in the civil engineering world is everywhere. Software is new technologies. Everything's going so fast. As a company of about 70 people or so at your stage, how does Core kind of keep an eye on the technology and what you need, what can help you, what can help your clients? How does that look? I, I think, I mean, certainly there's a lot of components like that. In starting the company, one of our visions was to, to literally, for everything we do, uh, engineering consulting companies just kind of, we, we want to challenge the status quo with everything we do. And so as we were growing as a company, uh, we put technology as one of our highest priorities um, and, to, and to try and think of it differently than maybe what a, a, a standard competitor would, would normally do. And um, an example of, you know, thought, certainly we use, you know, CAD systems and civil 3D and everything, but we specifically recruit people to our company to expand our capability and our mm -hmm. customization and our automation and all of our CAD platforms and even in our um, uh, creating uh, efficiencies and uh, uh, streamlining, say, production support so that we can kind of do more with less and then to also factor in and some of this technology better quality control that we know that again certainly when you've got a big plat platform of software on every computer you still there's a lot of the the buttons and the methods to put stuff in the computer and CAD there needs to be consistency to get a quality product and to be able to deliver on a schedule and everything and so we've always thought of trying to challenge all of our groups saying how can we do this better because I feel like we can we have a lot of control internally to have an impact on our clients satisfaction and the value they get out of our services but things like certainly remote working and all this technology that is every day now um, we were already pushing as a company and already had a a smaller population of remote workers prior to the pandemic and we're already looking at technology improvements um, um, prior to any announcement of anything about uh, you know a pandemic coming and so we were already expanding significantly 
um, everybody's availability to be 100% remote at any given time because of our commitment to giving employees better balance and the flexibility that they don't need to be anchored to an office or um, you know, just having that remote capability to either be working from a coffee shop or their basement or you know, some work share place or even if they need to travel that they can work and kind of fit work in around their life and everything. And so prior to the pandemic, we were implementing the capability for 100% of our employees to be remote, yeah. expanded to everyone already and had already spent the money on that technology and the primary reason we were doing that is because Denver historically gets some pretty bad snowstorms. Mm. It can be 80 degrees one day and the following day it can be a blizzard and 20 degrees and all the roads are shut down, schools are shut down, and we saw that that had an impact to our revenue. And so we said, well, why don't we just make it where if people need the flexibility to work from home and to if their kids are going to be out of school that day, why don't we just give them the ability to, you know, be able to work from home. Well, everybody needs a laptop. Everybody needs the technology. They have to be able to get in to our systems to connect and work. So we were already experimenting with uh, teams and expanding, you know, the instant messaging capabilities and building that. And then we had already fully adopted Zoom and all this stuff. So when the pandemic hit, it was kind of effortless for us to literally go 100% remote very quickly. And I attribute that's part of ingrained in the culture of our firm of to problem solve and already kind of have, you know, ideas and components in place where we can rapidly accelerate stuff that our competitors never figured it out a year or two later. That's great. We yeah. Really the curve. No, that's great. And that, that was kind of be my, be my next question, which you kind of answered in that it sounds like this hybrid work environment is something that core is going to kind of stick with to give people flexibility. Absolutely. But again, like every firm we've learned, um, I, I do think there's definitely a place for it, I think. But as a firm, you kind of need to put parameters and expectations and accountabilities. And we were very weak on that when we first started doing this pre-pandemic. Uh, there weren't very good accountabilities or even expectations. I think it was kind of a uh, people were afraid to contact someone that was working from home even though it's been communicated, I am working from home today. Well, I don't want to bother that. I'm like, well, they're working. <laughs> they're part of the team. Uh, you need to be available for a meeting if you're working from home. Now that the pandemic started and we've evolved over the last few years, that's a normal expectation that you can do that, but then still have the flexibility if you need to be at home for personal reasons. Um, uh, there, there isn't a stigma attached to that. And so I think we, how we do it is we definitely have a hybrid system. Um, uh, I think deep work days are very valuable so that people can get away from the distractions, but then we've evolved as a company where our employees really enjoy coming into the office because they, I believe they kind of feel like they're missing out on the culture. They're missing out on the engagement because we've tried to make the office experience really unique where people come here and enjoy that time and they enjoy the collaboration time, but then they still get the flexibility to work remote. And, um, but we have seen as a business standpoint that when we were hundred percent remote, that growth and the mentoring and the communication and the collaboration just was not as good as it could be. And I know some industries, maybe it works better, but for a young industry and a young company like we are, um, you're, 20 and 30 something engineers and surveyors and scientists, that's part of their mentoring and apprenticeship process is having these conversations when you're there in the office, you know, and overhearing, you know, what's happening, you know, in the cubicle or the conference room right around the corner or in the kitchen because that's what's kind of missing. You don't have interactions like that over Zoom. It's planned, it's structured, you have a start and an end. And so these kind of side learning opportunities just don't happen as much. Yeah, no, I think the cohesiveness and having those interactions definitely are value. And we found with talking with a lot of our clients and helping some of them with these hybrid guidelines is that 
Some touch points in person are really valuable, although it's also nice to have the hybrid opportunity or option, but it's, you know, it's really coming up with a good mix. That's really yep. going to, what's going to be best for, for your company. So for sure. All right, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I often get asked from like working civil engineers, just to get your, your take on them. What is the number one trait that you feel is important for civil engineering professionals to have today? Skill, trait. Um, for, for me specifically, and this is the type of stuff you're not taught in school is, um, I've evolved thinking our industry is about, we do technical work. So you've got to have sound technical people, but to me, that's kind of the, the foundational kind of boilerplate type stuff, but any young technical professional, whether they're an engineer or not, um, needs to always be thinking about how to improve their communication skills. Because really what we work in, while it is technically focused, um, it, it's, it's a people industry. We can't do anything of what we do without people collaborating, whether that's collaborating with the municipality to do your designs and to get your designs approved and to go through the negotiation with that, that's people skills. Uh, working with clients, that's people skills um, of how to communicate to a, a client, set scopes and budgets. And some clients are very skilled. Uh, some clients are not so skilled of how they, you know, uh, achieve their vision for whatever they're trying to do, whether if it's infrastructure or energy or development project. And so uh, that takes people skills and skill sets and communication. And then we get to our own internal team. How do you become a more successful uh, in your profession? The better communication and people skills that you can develop and learn along the way. And really, it just comes down to confidence. Uh, the more success you'll have in the industry, and especially if you want to. Um, move beyond of just being in a technical focus. If you wanna move into more leadership levels and, and aspire to be more at the business level, um, your focus really heavily becomes uh, people and communication focus. And so that's where I've had philosophies of not, even from an entry level graduate on whatever position to start getting them comfortable with just, uh, networking and communicating with others and to taking um, say ownership of certain projects where they can be in the lead and start building you know kind of those foundational skill sets that deal with how you work with people and communicate with people and um, to be a successful team. No that's great I, we like to say at EMI that your technical knowledge and education is kind of like an invitation to the dinner and then like you have to develop all those other skills like communication skills, networking, et cetera, that are going to help you then grow, you know, your career. And so it's a good message that, you know, we have to be technically sound, but that's kind of like the baseline for where we're going. And then we, we all have the ability to continue to build some of these other skills. Absolutely. So another question that we get often is how can I make sure that I'm adding value to my organization? I think, um, Again, I can't, I can answer this for core. I don't know what it's like, but I'd, I'd hope that people are in organizations that um, give people the freedom to have a voice. And so for what I look for, for adding value in core is, my gosh, I love people that, again, comes down to communication that ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. They, they want to know why, they want to know, um, how this functions, how it works, how they can do certain components of their job better or, or understand certain technical elements better to get more efficient. I love people that are, are have this, uh, and, and again, the growth mindset, which is something and a quality we look for in people we hire that have this kind of approach to constant learning um, and, and the evolution that they want to learn and grow their careers. And it's, like that each step is kind of a building block. And so I think that's the best thing that at least for a firm like core, for people that want to come in and evolve and learn along the way and have an expectation that they can be 
um, kind of pivot with whatever opportunity um, comes about, I think we'll have the best opportunity to work for a firm. Certainly some people that like a little bit more structure and um, like to do certain elements certainly can have a great career path too. But for me, I really enjoy those people that are willing to kind of maybe take some risks and uh, even be more humble to say, I don't know everything. And can my, Blake, can you or someone else help me learn some other aspects that might enhance my own personal development and my career growth? So it's, it's really that lifelong learner uh, approach, I think, pays dividends, not only to be a better professional, but just to be a better human being. Yeah, for sure. That continuous improvement, I think that that's a really great way to approach one's career for sure. So what if someone at core came to you and said, you know, Blake, I really want to help you solve the company's biggest challenge right now. How can I do that? What is that challenge? How, what would you say to them? What is the challenge or how would I? What, what is the challenge? Like what that, like if someone in your company wanted to help you, like, Hey, you know, we just want to help the company grow, help the company get better. What, what's like the biggest challenge that you're facing right now to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, that one's pretty easy and I'm sure it's very similar to other firms. And, and this is where we do get, it's a team effort. It's, it's, it's recruiting. Um, it's, it's core for the amount of work that we could possibly have and the client exposure we have, we could do more and we could grow our revenue, but we don't, we don't have enough talent. Um, and it, obviously in a consulting business, your, your revenue growth is directly correlated to how many people you have and how you can start to increase your capacity to do more work. And so we actually had to revise our projections for this year because we kind of saw what was going on and how ultra competitive our industry marketplace is for people that we're not going to quite get there and but that's okay we're not a public company and uh uh for what matters to us most is you know high quality people uh doing high quality work for great clients and having you know some fun along the way and enjoying what we do that that's success and so it's not necessarily tied to a metric but we do get everybody within core to really say you're, how your component, you're an ambassador for core and you're part of the brand and you're part of the culture and identity, go out and talk about core because mm -hmm. that's part of the recruiting process that to bring more people into the melting pot to make us better every day. And so that's how they can participate with the growth and success. And by the way, clients like to work with people that enjoy where they work too and are, in, are having fun also and because that creates a better customer experience. And so um, that's the biggest problem we have, but that's where we do have a system set up where people can get involved at all levels on that, you know, creating uh, that filter for, for recruiting for core. Awesome. Yeah. And that is really the same problem that I think everyone that's come on this show has, has expressed. And, you know, it's obviously an industry-wide problem. That's not going to get any easier with like some of the funding and stuff that's coming, of course, I know. down the line. Um, all right. So I got a couple last just kind of uh, questions here just around yourself to wrap things up. You come to work each day and obviously as the leader of the company, you got a lot of things going on. Engineers are always interested in thinking about productivity and approaching a day. How do you decide kind of what you're working on each day? What does that process look like for you? I, I can say years ago, I had more of a structure um, I, I think as my career has evolved, I used to be more technically involved with specific, you know, projects and clients and, and part of that, you know, just kind of letting go and saying there's a better opportunity for others to come in and run the day to day for what I do now. It's pretty much, which is what I enjoy. I'm able to come in and work, uh, for the most part entirely on the business every day. And that has pros and cons. I, I do kind of miss the the more interactions that I used to get more with design teams and kind of being able to be that guide, you know, to, to be the creative person guiding a project and to assembling a team around to go solve the client's problem. Um, and so I spend more of my time just being, you know, checking in with clients and being more at a high level, obviously quality control 
in kind of in a mentoring role and everything. But, at, you know, from people that have a technical focus, it is hard to evolve of giving away of being in the details all the time. But I do feel like that's part of just the confidence level of figuring out your place and how it evolves. But I do know when you're scaling a business, you do need someone and a team that's fully dedicated on running the business too. And that's something that um, Core struggled with a little bit because if, if no one's really looking at the long term and you're kind of reacting day by day, that's not really healthy and best for the business and best for all of our employees too, because that could be a risk for the company. So my day to day, day, to day is very hectic. Uh, but at the same time, there is no day that looks exactly the same. And for my my personality and disposition, that's fine. I, I kind of, I think I relish in the chaos a little bit. And then when all the fires are happening, it's like, I feel like I've got a plan. Let's help push it forward and, and make things better. That's great. Is there a, a book an author, a philosophy that maybe you've leaned on in terms of leadership or your own personal development that, you know, one that stuck with you that you've used over the years? Absolutely. I mean, I can sit, I kind of consume all media. Um, and certainly as media has evolved, I've kind of have bits and parts that I absorb more than others. I mean, when it, when it gets to like specific to, to like books and stuff, I mean, I know again of wanting to form a purpose-driven organization of, of whatever year it was, I think around Great Recession time, the very first time I saw the video of Simon Sinek, um, mm. you know, and discovering your why, that mm. was like a, a true aha moment. So I've always followed him and all of his components of his various books and everything and have very much modeled our our employee experience and our client experience and even our internal philosophies on exact I mean for, for what he speaks I directly connect to that but then that's you know not enough I mean I I do I do like to kind of expose myself and get referrals from obviously other people I know in the business and like currently uh, I just decided we're, we're strategizing on succession within core right now. And so I picked up another, I like short reads too, that are quick mm -hmm. and easy. We're distracted and there's too many things. I've got three kids. So it's hard to have a lot of quality time, but uh, this book by Art Gensler, that's, you know, the founder mm -hmm. of Gensler Architecture, this arts principles, which is a uh, lots of short sections of just, these are things you need to think about as a leader of a firm and to, have a high quality firm and that's one I'm actually rereading and I just feel like getting those perspectives help reinforce my confidence as a leader even though a lot of them you're like nodding your head going I know that but it, it just rereading it and kind of sharing those experiences uh, uh, helps you know in, in being a stronger person and stronger leader. That's great. All right last question for you as the leader of a firm, you know, I think when you start your career, obviously you can find a lot of different mentors potentially, but when you're kind of the CEO, I would imagine it gets a little bit harder. Like the pool probably is a little bit smaller. So in terms of like your personal development and your growth as a leader at this point, do you look for like connecting with other CEOs or like different groups or like to be able to keep up with like industry trends and keep sharpening your own skills? Like, how does that look for someone when you get to that level? That's actually a great question and something I underappreciated. Um, I never realized in getting to this level how lonely it can be. Um, and so any firm leader that's out there, whether you're a younger company like Core or just starting out, um, or you've been in the business a long time with a firm that's well established, uh, when you're being thrust up into certain levels is, um, and it took me a while to recognize this, even though I had been given the advice early in my career is, build relationships that are outside of a competitive you know, environment or even the, you know, the, the typical networking environment to, and, and build relationships that aren't transactional. 
Yeah. Um, some of the best things that have helped me is certainly we've had consultants that have helped us as a company. I've had executive training to be a better individual and leader, but I felt like that only went so far um, over the last probably four to five plus years. I've developed a kind of a nationwide network of various firms that are in similar stages that that core is at. And I've discovered going, oh, my gosh, we're all struggling with the same stuff. <laughs> have the same stresses and we're all kind of figuring things out on our own because there's not some perfect solution out there because uh, it's like flavors of ice cream, you know, there it's endless. And so being able to have certain more formal round tables or just getting a group of people that I can have breakfast with here locally or have, uh, especially like during COVID and the pandemic, um, I have this one group of a cohort that we just created on our own that we would have bi-weekly uh, Zoom meetings. And that was some of the best, highest quality time. That was my MBA time right there mm -hmm. to listen about how all these firms are addressing their, their struggles and stresses and how they're achieving success. It, it was invaluable. And um, uh, not to discount the services you provide, which are very valuable too, but I, I think it's, you, you got to get all those sources of information and learning from everywhere you can get it. And uh, so I actually pay it back when I hear about people here local to Denver or starting a firm, I reach out and say, hey, I'd be happy to go to breakfast or lunch or have a beer and, and tell you how CORE got started. And mm -hmm. And, and I, I'd be happy to kind of help and advise you on how to run your business better. And so you're not making the stupid mistakes that I made. That's great. No, it's a huge part of it. it. Sounds like you kind of created a mastermind group type of thing, you know, to meet on these every other weeks, which is great. And I think giving back is valuable. I try to do that too. I mean, I feel like if I can help someone avoid making the same mistakes that I made, it's probably a good thing. I'm sure people have done that for me in the past, right? So it's a good way to to give back. So, well, listen, this was really interesting. I think there was a lot of great points that I know civil engineering professionals out there are looking to learn more about from people like yourself who have the experience and have that, you know, that career trajectory that took you into this leadership position. And I just want to thank you for spending some time with us here today. Once again, Blake Calvert, president and CEO at Core Consultants. Blake, thanks so much for coming on the Civil Engineering CEO. Absolutely. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Blake Calvert. A lot of really interesting stuff on leadership growth and development for civil engineers. So please consider subscribing to our channel. We're putting out videos like this on a weekly basis because we want to help you engineer your own success. I'll see you next week.